let's go ahead and um, get settled. Hey, so we're going to be in the book of Judges, chapter 16, the book of Judges. So um, I am a child of the 80s and the 90s. That's right. <laughs> You're like, boomer? Like, chill out. I'm more Gen X than millennial. It's kind of weird. Um, but um, so that means that I grew up and a lot of the the people that I saw growing up were like these big time buff movie guys like Rambo and Arnold Schwarzenegger and Running Man and like Bloodsport with Van Damme and all these guys. And, and as, um, as people, like as you grow up and people are like, what do you want to do when you grow up? And everybody's like, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I was like, I want to save Nakatomi Plaza. <laughs> you know, like die hard. Like I want to be that guy. And I remember playing with my toys, my G.I. Joes. And um, so you grow up watching these guys on TV, these big, tough, buff. This is like before CGI. This is before like all the Marvel movies and all that stuff. And, and, and that's kind of the influence. Um, but even as a child, one of the stories that you just grow up loving because of what you're seeing is the one that we're going to look at today. And it's Samson. And Samson is considered to be the strongest man that ever lived. Now, it wasn't because he had amazing workouts or he lifted weights. It was because the Lord gave him that strength. And God used him to help the people of God. Now, the thing that's crazy about Samson is as strong as he was physically, he was actually extremely weak morally. And Samson, as we look at his life, you know, we might even ask, how can God use somebody like Samson? I mean, this guy, he was just a, like, we, we didn't know. He was so unpredictable, and, and he had, like, some crazy things about him, but the Lord still used him to help deliver his people. So before we dive into the story of Samson, because um, there are some things we could learn from Samson, because when we talk about Samson and his downfall, you know, we have to look at some compromises that he decided to make. And like we learned from David, whenever we make small little compromises, all those little compromises add up to one big downfall. It always starts real small and easy, and it just snowballs into this, this big thing. And we're going to see that with Samson. So what do we know about this guy? What do we know about Samson? So when Samson was born, his parents took what we call a Nazarite vow. And the Nazarite vow, we, you could find it in a Numbers chapter 6, but I'll go ahead and put three main points about the Nazarite vow up on the screen. And these are things that we have to consider because Samson, his parents took the Nazarite vow for Samson, and it was supposed to last his entire life. Now, any man or woman that took the Nazarite vow, it, it would just last for a few years or a few months. Um, however, like they wanted to consecrate themselves before the Lord. But there were three main things that the, that the Nazarite vow required. Number one is you must abstain from any fruit of the vine. So that means no drinking wine, but also no drinking grape juice, no eating grapes, even raisins. Like you couldn't touch anything of the vine. Number two, you could not cut your hair. See, John took the Nazarite vow. You know what <laughs> So you could, not, you could not cut your hair at all. Like no razor can touch your head. And then number three is you could not touch a dead body. It couldn't be an animal. It couldn't be a human. You could not do that because you would disqualify yourself from the sacrifices at the temple. So you, you would be considered ceremonially unclean. All right, so Samson grew up. He's living his life. These things, his parents instilled this in him. But Samson liked to play with fire. He liked to kind of push the boundaries a little bit. Um, so what we're going to do is let's, let's go ahead and start um, in chapter 16, and we're going to look at this story. Let's look at the first three verses, because I think this is going to set us up uh, nicely as we understand the person of Samson, the strongest man that ever lived. So verse 1, one day Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. He went to spend the night with her. The people of Gaza were told, Samson is here. So they surrounded the place and, wait, and lay in wait 
for him all night at the city gate. They made no move during the night, saying, at dawn, we're going to jump him. I mean, kill him. But Samson laid there only until the middle of the night. Then he got up and took hold of the doors of the city gate together with the two posts. He tore them loose, bar and all. He lifted them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. All right, these first three verses are a good synopsis of who Samson is. So verse 1, look what it says. One day Samson went to Gaza. All right, why did he go to Gaza? Because Gaza is where the Philistines hang out. So Samson went into the Philistine territory, and he went to fraternize with the Philistines. And not just that, but then he went and he slept with a prostitute there. See, something that we're going to learn is that Samson has a type. He does. And that type is Philistine, low standards, Philistine woman. He loves himself some Philistine women. Because we see this in chapter 14 where he begs his parents, like he sees a Philistine woman, he's like, I want her as my wife. Go get her for me. Like that's the kind of guy he is. And we're going to see why that's an issue here. So he goes into enemy territory. He spends the night there. The Philistines are like, oh, he's on our turf now, and he's a little busy. So what we're going to do is when he wakes up, we're all going to, like, just jump him. We're going to kill him. He's in our turf. We finally got him, guys. But Samson, he gets up at the middle of the night because he likes to play with fire a little bit. He gets up in the middle of the night, but the gates are locked. So what does he do? He does exactly what I would have done. I would have just ripped the door with hinges and everything. And car- No. <laughs> Samson goes, it says that he takes the doors of the city gates. You know, I was like doing some research on this. And what theologians say is that the doors of the city gates would weigh about 800 to 1,000 pounds. And what Samson did was he grabbed them, hinges and all, ripped them off. And then it says that he lifted them on his shoulders and he carried them to the top of the hill that faced Hebron. So I want you all to picture this. This is crazy. He has these massive gates on his back, and what's wild is that the Hebron, that hill on Hebron, is about 38 miles from Gaza. So this dude, 800 to 1,000 pounds, just hiking to Hebron, like, do 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 like, I have nothing else to do in the middle of the night, and he puts them at the top of the hill, 38 miles. Guys, this is like, this is like, this is like running a marathon, but that's, this shows the type of strength that Samson was given by God Almighty. This is not just some like he's stronger than every, no. This is like superpower, superhuman strength, and it's real. So let's see what happens. Look at verse 4. Sometimes later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Zorak, whose name was Delilah. Y'all remember her? No? All right, anyway. 103.7 at night. All the lonely people. All right, so (laughs) I want to dedicate this song. No, it's joking. All right, so all right, so what's the big deal? So remember, I told you Samson has a type. So Samson's weakness for women was of low character and of Philistine loyalty. And we see this in chapter 14. We see this throughout his life. He always went in Delilah was a Philistine territory. That's where the Valley of Zorak is. Why is this such a big deal? Why are some of us like, well, Ricky, what's the big deal? He, he likes what he likes. See, the problem is that Samson was separated. He was consecrated to the Lord. He was, he was chosen. And when Samson went to his parents and said, I want her, that Philistine, this is in chapter 14, his dad was like, Isn't there somebody of your own people that you should be looking at instead? Because you're not supposed to be, like, with the enemy of Israel. Like, you shouldn't be, like, like partnering with the enemy of Israel. And something that we're going to learn is that when you are called by God, relationships matter. It is very, very dangerous. Women, you need to find a man that loves Jesus. I don't care how much money he makes or how good he looks. If he's morally bankrupt, you're in for a long haul. It's going to be difficult. Men, especially if you're called, you need to find a woman who loves Jesus just as much as you do. 
it makes absolutely no sense for you to be living in a calling with someone that has no interest of what you're doing. Where is that relationship going to take you? And Samson is going to compromise because his feelings are stronger than the truth. And a lot of us operate in our feelings. We talked about this a long time ago. Yes, I'm in love. Yes, I think they're beautiful. Yes, they wooed me. And, and, and yes, I have a great time. But the truth is, if they don't know Jesus, you have no business with them. So listen, forget your feelings. I mean, they're real. But we need to make sure that we operate in the truth of God. And the truth was that Samson was consecrated. Samson's family took the Nazarite vow. Samson knew exactly what he was called to and who he was supposed to be. And he neglected that. And he said, ooh, but I like them. And that's going to be his downfall. Because something we're going to learn today is that when you get comfortable in your compromise, it's going to end up taking you out. It's going to be very difficult for you. So listen, relationships matter, regardless of how you feel. And if you're called to something, and if God's calling you, and God's pressing you on something, and the person that, that you claim that you love is nowhere near your calling, hey, listen, red flag, wave the flag. They're not going to change. It's what it's going to be. We need to be careful with this. And Samson falls into this. Look at verse 5. Let's keep talking about it. Y'all, please don't get mad at me. I'm just talking the word. Don't kill the messenger. All right, here you go. So verse 5, the rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, see if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so we, might, so we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. All right, so there's two important details I want to look at here in verse 5. Because it said, try to figure out what the secret of his strength is. So what the, what, the, what the Philistines are looking at, so they go to Delilah because she's one of them. And they're like, so what, what they're saying is, what's the secret of his strength? So Samson probably didn't look like a humongous bodybuilder. Like that's the picture that we look at at strength. He might have just looked like Kevin Sorbo and Hercules. Just a regular looking dude. They couldn't figure out why he was so strong. So they're like, Delilah, we want you to, to, you know, you're with him. You can manipulate him a little bit. Can you find out the secret of his strength? And we're going to give you 1,100 shekels of silver. Now, that might look like a lot of money, but I did some research. And 1,100 shekels of silver in today's time is about $56,000. It's a lot, but it's not like change your life money, you know? Like, she's not going to get rich off of this. Like, she cannot, like, just retire off of this. And I, and I believe that the author of, of, of uh, Judges is giving us this detail because Delilah sold him out for money, but it wasn't, like, a substantial amount of money. She just took the money. Now, I'm not saying she's a gold digger, but she's not messing with no broke, broke, Samson. <laughs> all right, so she's all about the money. And listen... And this is, another, this is another good look because, listen, if you're with somebody and their goals are one-sided, that's a red flag. You see, because with Delilah, it was all about her. It was all about what she could get. She saw the dollar signs, and she's like, bump Samson. I'm trying to get paid right now. And listen, if you're with somebody and all they care about is their goals and their dreams and, and you're just along for the ride, red flag. Be careful. Because if they're not going to help you or not be, remember, we're in partnership together. That's what marriage is. It's a partnership. Red flag. Be careful with that. So let's see what happens. This gets interesting. All right. So Delilah said to Samson, tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Now, that's kind of a weird request, isn't it? Like, oh, Samson, how can I tie you up? Now, I don't know what Samson's thinking. Maybe he's like, ooh, a game. Maybe he's into this. Maybe he's like 50 Shades of Gaza. I don't know. Maybe this is his thing. <laughs> like, chill. I haven't slept much this weekend. All right, so you don't know. But look what Samson does because Samson starts lying, but it's almost like a game to him. Look what it says in verse 7. Samson answered her, if anyone ties me with seven fresh bowstrings, that have not been dried, I'll become as weak as any other man. Huh. 
Now, Samson knows he's lying. He knows he, he could break out of this. But you see, this is where the small compromises start to creep in because this becomes a game to Samson, and it's all good, and it's cute right now, but it's going to evolve. So look what happens. So verse 8, then the rulers of the Philistines brought her seven fresh bow ties um, that had not been dried, and she tied him up with them. Now with men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But they sna- so. But he snapped the bowstrings as easily as a piece of string snaps when it comes close to a flame. Y'all, that's like nothing. That's like toothpaste, like a toothpick, like, like nothing. That's like dental floss. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. And here comes Delilah, said to Samson, you made me look like a fool. You lied to me. Come now, tell me how you can be tied. That's a weird transition. Now, if I was Samson, I would be wondering, like, why do you want to tie me up so bad? Why do you want to know the secret of my strength? What, what are you about? How come there was a bunch of dudes in the room? <laughs> hmm. It's getting a little weird. Maybe. <laughs> it's getting a little bit strange. But you see, Samson doesn't do this. You see, what Delilah did is exactly what Esau did. Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. Judas sold out Jesus for some money. You see, some people are exact, some people are extremely easily bought because they don't know who they are if they have low character. You see, Delilah, she was just trying to figure it out so she'd get paid and move on. So look at verse 9 with the men, oh, I'm sorry, verse 10. Then Delilah said to Samson, you have made a fool of me and you lied to me. Come now, tell me how you could be tied. Verse 11, he said, If anyone ties me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I'll become as weak as any other man. Now, Samson knows he's lying here because in chapter 15, verse 13, he does the same exact thing to the Philistines. He turns himself in, and he's like, as long as you don't kill me, I'll turn myself in. And they tied him with new ropes, and as soon as he became available, he busted them open, took a donkey jawbone, and killed a 1,000 of them. He knows he's lying right here, but he wants to play the game. So what happens? So look at verse 12. So Delilah took some new ropes, tied them up. Then with men hidden in the room, he called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the ropes off his arms as they were threads. Delilah said to Samson, all this time you have been making a fool of me and lying to me. Tell me how you can be tied. And then he replied, if you weave seven braids of my head into a fabric of loom and tighten it with a pin, I, be, I will become weak as any man. So while he was sleeping, Delilah took the seven braids of his head, wove them into fabric, and tightened it with a pin. Now, at this moment in time, what, it's getting weird. Because it's inching up to the truth. First, it started with some bounds, and you tie me up. But now it's getting to his anointing. It's starting to creep up where God has made sacred. And he's like, if you make a carpet out of my head, because that's exactly what this is. This, 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 this device is to make rugs. So if I'm sleeping, and I feel, and I wake up, and I have this massive device tied to my head, wouldn't that like say like maybe there's something wrong here? Because now it's going beyond like, oh, this is a game to, okay, now it's just, this is getting weird. So he has this massive thing tied to his head with his hair entangled inside of it. And then again, she called him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He woke up from his sleep and pulled the pin out of the loom with the fabric. Verse 15, then she said to him, how can I say I love you? Uh Uh-oh, now it's going to get deep. Here comes the heartstrings. How can I say I love you when you won't even confide in me? And I could just see her with the boohoo and the waterworks and everything. This is the third time you have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. Okay, Samson, she's trying to take you out three times. 
Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, put the blame on you. Any J. Cole fan? Uh, that's right. Come on, guys. Three times, people. <laughs> yes. Get the catch. Right? So, so it's like three times, and you still don't understand. There's got to be something a little bit suspicious about this. So what happens? Look at verse 16. Now she pulls out the secret weapon. All right, now, men, listen to me. All guys, look at me. I'm about to read something. Do not look at the person next to you after I read this, okay? <laughs> this is going to save you today. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. Don't make eye contact. Just look at me. All right. <laughs> hey, oh, oh. I was like, where's William at? All right, so. <laughs> And look, this is, this is the key to Samson's downfall, because this also happened with his first wife, that she just continually went at him, and he fell into it. Look at verse 17. So she was nagging to get him. So she told him everything. Now, why, why is this big? You see, in Proverbs, there's two verses that actually talk about this. Proverbs 27, 15, a quarrelsome woman or a nagging a nagging wife is like a dripping, um, the dripping of a leaky roof in a rainstorm. Restraining her is like restraining the wind or grasping oil from the hand. Proverbs 21.9, better is to live in the corner of the roof than to share a house with a nagging wife. There's something about this, her, her usage of this that folded Samson. So he told her everything. Verse 17, no razor ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as any other man. Boom, there it is. He finally gave in. He gave in. Look at verse 18, when Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back once more. He has finally told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with silver in their hands. They're like, we finally got him. No more games. We got him. Let's get her money. We're good. And, and you know what's funny is after the incident, we never hear from Delilah ever again. She got paid and she's out because she's all about herself. She wasn't about Samson. Then after put now here's where it gets crazy, all right? After putting him to sleep on her lap, I don't know what a girl did to make him sleep on her lap, but she schemed this thing out. She knew exactly what she was doing. She knows Samson. She knows, like, the ins and outs of the relationship, and she used it against him. She put him to sleep on her lap. And then she called for someone to shave off seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him, and his strength left him. You know, when we get so comfortable with our compromise, we end up relaxing in our recklessness. We get so comfortable in our compromise that we just end up just falling asleep where we don't belong because we don't feel anything. It has, you see, we see this in 1 John. That whenever you are so deep in your sin, it's almost like you, you become numb to it. We call that habitual sin. And we should be, have habitual righteousness instead. There should be something in us that's like, this ain't right. And Samson compromised so much that he became numb to the situation. And he ended up falling asleep in the lap of the person that's trying to take him out. How many times do we do that? That the one thing that Satan is using to try to take us away from our faith, to try to destroy us, we end up falling asleep right on top of it like it's no big deal. How was Jonah able to sleep on the boat in a storm? How do you rest? How do you feel so comfortable? Because you come numb to it. So when they called, she called Samson this time. Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And here's the scariest part of the story. After he awoke from his deep sleep and thought, I'll just go out and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord left him. 
You see, the hard part is not that he lost his strength. The scary part is that he did not realize that God left him. How many of us are operating on our own strength, not realizing because of our sin, God has removed himself from us? That, for me, that's, that's one of the most terrifying statements in Scripture. This is actually part of God's wrath that we see, the wrath of abandonment. He did not know that, that he was departed. How does that work, Rick? Because of, because of our sin. See, like, our sin forfeits the presence of God. You got to understand, God is a holy and righteous God. You cannot live however you want and expect God to show up because he's holy and he's righteous, and, and, and he thrives on that. And we see that all through Scripture. In Genesis 6, 3, Proverbs 1, 24, Matthew 15, 12, Romans 1, 24 through 32. That, guys, this is so terrifying to me that when we get so much in our sin, God's like, okay, you want to love your sin? Go for it. And I'm going to depart from you. Now, the good news is that we serve a loving and a graceful God. So whenever we realize what we've done, we could always run back to him, and he covers us in his grace and forgiveness. But Samson is going to learn a terrifying lesson right here. Then the Philistines seized him, verse 21. They gouged out his eyes. They took him down to Gaza, binding him with bronze shackles. They set him to grinding grain in the prison. Isn't it funny? Like the first time when we first started the chapter, Samson went into enemy territory and he did whatever he wanted there. Now Samson is going back into enemy territory without the presence of God, and he's binded, blinded, and grinded. You know, this is a great picture of what sin does to us. When we fall into the sin, it blinds you, it'll bind you, and then it's going to grind you out. Because the first thing that goes is your vision. They took Samson's eyes. Why? The Bible says without, vi without vision, you perish. It's all about eyesight. It's all about, it's all about where you're looking. Hebrews chapter 12 says, like, man, you place your eyes on Christ, the author and the perfecter of our faith. If you're failing, it's all about eyesight. It's about vision. And what they did with Samson is that they removed his vision so that way he was not able to see. See, that's the impact of sin. First, your vision is gone. Then your freedom is gone. Then your purpose is gone. That's exactly what happened to him. They took his eyes. He can't see. His vision's gone. They bound him up. His freedom is gone. He has no more strength. And then they put him to grind. Now his purpose is gone. He went from the strongest, most powerful man that God has ever made to someone who is doing some monotonous work in a prison somewhere that nobody will ever know if he lives or dies. That's exactly what sin does in our lives. But verse 22, there's hope. Verse 22 says, but his hair on his head began to grow after, again, after they had shaven it. So his hair is growing back, y'all. His strength is coming back. Now, where do we go from here? This is crazy. So the Philistines thought they won. They got this. Verse 23, now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to celebrate, saying, our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. Dagon is the same exact God that the Ninevites worship. He's like the human with the fish head. Kind of weird. But they worshiped him. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, Our God has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who laid waste our land and multiplied our slain. Man, Samson went from a hero to zero just like that. Because he decided to get comfortable in his compromises. So when God leaves us, it's, it's, it's scary. So I just want to look at a couple of, of things that we could learn from Samson. But then also, how do we come out of that? So a couple things, what happens when you get comfortable in a compromise? Number one is you become oblivious to the obvious. You become oblivious to the obvious. Samson, when he was with Delilah, she was like, hey, how do we take your strength? All right, tie me up. Hey, how do we take your strength? Tie me up. Hey, how do I, how do I take your strength? You don't love me. All right, cut my hair. Hey, you embarrass me. I'm going to nag you until you tell me. Don't you understand that this woman is trying to bury you? Like, Samson, is it that good, bro? 
This woman is trying to take you out. Why? Why don't you understand this? Because when you are in compromise and when you are sin, you become oblivious to the obvious situation. The obvious thing is that she's trying to take you out. She's trying to get to where your strength is. But because we're so blinded in our sin and we so lean into our compromise, we could become oblivious to it. Why do you think you have people who are living in sin that is destroying their lives and they're just like, I guess it is what it is. They're oblivious to it. Why? Because that's exactly what sin does. It blinds you. You can't see the effects of it. Number two, what does compromise do? It depletes us from God's strength. Listen, as soon as Samson told Delilah what the secret of his strength was, God removed his presence from Samson. You see, the strength wasn't inside of his hair. Like, the, his hair wasn't magical. No, the strength was in the vow that Samson made to God. It, it was in, it was in that, that Nazarite vow. And as soon as Samson surrendered that, God said, okay, I'm out. Listen, as soon as we surrender what God has called us to, God's like, I'm going to have to pull myself out, and you're going to have to figure this thing out yourself. You're going to have to mope in your sin. You're going to have to love your sin because this is the only way you're going to, have, you're going to understand that you're going to be in a need of a Savior. So God's going to pull himself out. We become numb to our sin. Number three is what I already mentioned. What, what compromise does, first it blinds us, then it binds us, and then it grinds us. Guys, there is... Uh, kind of like a template to sin. We, we see this all through Scripture, that whenever you fold into your sinful nature, you lose your vision, you lose your sight of Christ, you lose your sight of your calling, you forget everything that God has called you to. You lose your vision. Then you become a slave to it, and then it's going to grind you out. It's going to take your purpose from you. And you're going to spend the rest of your life walking around doing what God has not called you to do. Man, there's nothing more fearful in life to do something that doesn't matter and think that it does. And then the last thing that we learned, so go to number four, is that when you become comfortable with your compromise, you learn to rest in your recklessness. Whenever you become so comfortable with what you're compromising with, man, you're able to lay back and be, oh, man, it is all good here, and there is chaos in your life. You don't even realize it. That you are sleeping and what's destroying you. So we got to be alert. So where do we, how do we end this? You know what I find fascinating about the story of Samson? Samson never had any battles. Samson never led any armies. Now Gideon did. All the other judges did. Samson never really fought anybody because there was really nobody for him to compete with. He was the strongest man in the world. He killed a lion with his bare hands. He killed a thousand Philistines with a donkey jawbone. But you know who Samson's greatest enemy was? Samson. Samson's greatest enemy was himself. You know, when we look at, there's, there's three things that us as believers struggle with. Number one, it's the world. Right? Jesus talks about this. Don't love the things of the world. Don't love the ways of the world. Avoid the world. Number two, it's the enemy. It's Satan. We do have an enemy. There is a compromise. Like, there's somebody that wants to take you out. There's somebody that wants to destroy you. But number three is your own flesh. Most of the battles that we fight are not against the enemy. It's not against the world. It's against our own flesh. And that's why Jesus says... Take up your cross daily, die to yourself, and let me live through you. You see, Samson's biggest fight was him. Now, how do we end? Where do we go from this? I found something really fascinating here. So just to fast forward for time's sake, Samson's eyes are gone. He's in prison. They're praising their fake God. They're like, man, bring old boy out, man. Let's see Mr. Strong Samson guy. So they bring him out into a temple. There's about 3,000 Philistines having a party. And Samson tells the person, 
hey, when you bring me out, I want you to put me in between the pillars that are holding this place up. So put me in, the, in between the two pillars that are like the, the strongest pillars that are carrying the weight of this whole entire place. I want to be in between both of these pillars. So, of course, they think it's funny and they put them there. And as Samson is standing there, and as Samson is being made fun of, Samson prays to the Lord. And this is in verse 28. It's probably on the screen. It says, then Samson prayed to the Lord, sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Why would Samson, out of all things, why would Samson say this? There's two keys here in his prayer. Number one, why would he say, let me get revenge on my eyes? You see, his strength is going to come back, but his vision's gone forever. Even though Samson's hair is going to grow back, his strength's going to come, the Nazarite vow, the vow that he broke, it's done. It's gone. He can't see. Listen, his life is over. There's nothing he could do now. He has no, no sight. Could God heal his vision? Could God restore it? Yes, he could. But the consequence of sin, he probably thought he wasn't going to be able to. But look what Samson prays in the beginning. Sovereign Lord, remember me. Does that sound familiar to anybody? When I read that, I was like, that sounds so familiar. Where have I, where have I seen this before? Luke chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. One of the criminals hanging beside Jesus scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while we're at it. But the other criminal protested. He goes, don't you fear God even when you have, have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today will be with me in paradise. Guys, when Samson was there, he said, Lord, sovereign Lord, remember me. That's the same prayer that the thief on the cross gave. And Jesus said, you're going to be with me in paradise. When Samson said that, God's like, I am going to honor that prayer. I'm going to forgive you. And I will bring honor to my name through that prayer. You know what the thief on the cross shows us? That Jesus is the one that saves, not you. He didn't have no theological argument. He didn't, he didn't say the Lord's prayer. All he says is, Jesus, remember me. And Jesus says, I know your heart. Samson, Lord, remember me. And Samson's like, and God's like, I see your heart, Samson. And how does Samson end this thing? God gives him in strength one more time. He pushes the pillars, and he destroys all the Philistines and all their leadership. He destroys the Philistines. And because he destroyed the Philistines, all of them died, and Israel can now move forward. Guys, when we fall in our compromise and we fall in our sin, yes, there's going to be some consequences because of our sin. But Jesus, remember me. God, listen, we serve a God that forgives and that loves and, and that restores and renews. And he'll take your heart, but you must give it to him first and say, Lord, remember me, God. I don't know what I did wrong, but I want to live for you now. Remember me, God. Jesus, remember me. Forgive me. Help me. And Jesus is going to be there, and he's going to restore your sight. He's going to restore your strength, and he's going to restore your purpose. So that way you can live a life that is pleasing to his will and it's going to be incredible. It's going to bring glory to his name. And when you bring glory to his name, your life improves greatly. Jesus, remember me. So I pray today, Father, as we close and as we get into a time of worship, that, Lord, if, if we're in that place where, God, we've compromised so much that we have fallen asleep, God, in the very thing that wants to take us out, we have jacked this thing up. And we need a Savior, God. So, Lord, we pray the same prayer, God, with the same heart. So, Lord, I messed this thing up, but, God, please remember. And, Lord, please forgive. God, you have the power to save. 
and you have the power to restore, and you have the power to renew. So Jesus, we pray all these things in your holy and righteous name. Amen.